Um, this is a little bit of a change of direction. I was originally going to uh, give some results from a supplementation study, but it started rather later than expected, uh, and so I had to come up with a, uh, a different topic. Never mind. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many, many open questions in the area of macular carotenoids and their measurement. I'm just going to focus on uh, four of them. Uh, these are the questions I'm going to address. The first one um, resulted from a telephone conversation I had uh, a few months ago. Somebody called me up from the uh, supplement, uh, one of the supplement companies, and said to me, well, what's this I hear about mesozeaxanthin being referred to as the central carotenoid? Uh, I said, well, let me let me think about that because I don't really think uh, that's a justified uh, description. However, um, we've just heard from uh, an excellent talk from John Nolan, and this is from one of his earlier studies um, in which they selected subjects having this atypical macular pigment uh, spatial profile shown in red with the characteristic central dip. They divided the subjects up, if I remember, into three groups, two of which received a mesozeaxanthin containing supplement, and the third group uh, didn't. And uh, at the end of the supplementation period, the two groups that had received a mesozeaxanthin uh, ended up with the central dip filled in, as indicated by the uh, blue line. So acknowledging that result, um, which sort of looks like uh, suggesting that mesozeaxanthin could be regarded as the central carotenoid. Um, I went back to some of the earlier data um, to see whether it was justified or not. And this picture, I think this is the first time it's been shown at this particular meeting, but it, it's also done the rounds uh, at previous meetings. And it's based on HPLC analysis of concentric rings of retinal tissue. The uh, pale blue line shows the distribution of the uh, total macular carotenoids peaking in the center. The yellow curve is a ratio curve of lutein to total zeaxanthin. The conclusion from that curve is that zeaxanthin, total zeaxanthin, dominates in the center of the retina and lutein in the peripheral part of the retina. And finally, the purple curve is for the mesozeaxanthin to zeaxanthin ratio. That peaks in the center, and maybe because of that, and not really looking at the numbers, uh, leads people to conclude that mesozeaxanthin is a central carotenoid. But if we look at the numbers more carefully, I, I went back to the original uh, data based on the two studies at the bottom. I think the previous slide was not based on all of the data, so I went back to look at uh, everything that we had. And um, the, the first study, uh, we looked at just uh, lutein and total zeaxanthin stereoisomers in 14 eyes, and we used a central disc and uh, a large number of concentric um, annually, and then a very difficult experiment. We took 12 additional eyes, and we were actually able to look at the um, carotenoids in a half millimeter punch. Not easy uh, to do. Later, in the second study, we, uh, after the discovery of mesozeaxanthin, we looked at the stereoisomers of zeaxanthin. Notice here, we've got a lot more eyes, but the uh, cutters that we used were quite a lot coarser than for the original study. So I had to do a lot of interpolation to try to come up with the distributions of the individual uh, carotenoids, and now this is what they look like. So um, I've changed from eccentricity in millimeters to degrees because that's uh, a more familiar unit, particularly for people doing um, uh, flicker photometry or autofluorescence measurements. So we've got here all four of the 
uh, macular carotenoids, the three that we always talk about in the often forgotten SS zeaxanthin, which is not negligible and its presence perhaps uh, in, is indicative of some interesting biochemistry that's going on in the retina. For those of you who prefer to see what looks more like a profile, I've just reflected the data here uh, about the zero point. Um, and now we can see then that in fact, the most common RR isomer of zeaxanthin, at least for these samples, was the uh, dominant uh, carotenoid, followed closely by meso, followed by lutein, and then the much lower SS zeaxanthin. So I think um, people are, are usually saying that the three major carotenoids are present in a roughly one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio in the center of the retina, and I think this, uh, this particular slide indicates that quite nicely. I couldn't resist adding to this the distribution of cones. Um, that's based on the old classic Osterberg data, and from this we see a lovely coincidence between that distribution and the carotenoid distribution, suggesting either that uh, the carotenoids are there to protect the cones, or at least they appear to be sort of cone-related carotenoids. And one last thing before I leave this topic, uh, and this is going to remain, I think, an open question. So what I've done here is I've plotted the zeaxanthin, the RR zeaxanthin curve, and then I've normalized all the other carotenoids at the peak value just to see what the relative distributions look like. And um, the three zeaxanthin isomers all follow pretty much exactly the same trend, um, but they are different from lutein. And the reason this is kind of interesting is that um, Paul talked about the almost conclusive evidence that the mesozeaxanthin is derived through some sort of uh, uh, enzymatic process, presumably, from lutein. So then the question is, well, why doesn't the mesozeaxanthin curve follow the lutein curve? And then what about the SS uh, zeaxanthin as well? So it's possible that there is an additional process going on. Possibly the, um, the RR and the RS meso zeaxanthin undergo some type of oxidative uh, process and then uh, perhaps a non-stereospecific reduction back would possibly produce all three of the uh, zeaxanthin stereoisomers. Okay, my second uh, question uh, relates to what's uh, often called the edge effect of uh, uh, flicker photometry. Um, two conferences ago, we heard from Billy Wooten, who's a, um, a proponent of the so-called edge hypothesis, and this has relevance to those people who are interested in the profile of the macular pigment, which we heard about yesterday, you know, trying to get a good quantitative classification. The edge hypothesis basically says that when you present a circular stimulus, which in flick photometry means alternating between typically a blue and a green uh, light, and you see flicker because of a luminance mismatch, and then you adjust the relative intensities, uh, that um, once you achieve a luminance match at the edge of the stimulus, um, the edge of the stimulus and all the rest of the stimulus will stop flickering, uh, regardless of the fact that there might be a, a luminance mismatch in the central part of the uh, stimulated area. And uh, if that is correct, then the corresponding macular pigment optical density that you measure is the value at the eccentricity of the edge of the stimulus. So as a number of you know, I'm not a proponent of this particular uh, hypothesis based on the research that I've done, where we compared the macular pigment optical density for a 1.5 degree um, disc-like stimulus with um, the macular pigment measured with an annular stimulus, 
uh, author of Average Radius, or Average Diameter, 1.5 degrees. And this is for 10 subjects, left and right eyes, so there are 20 data points. They all lie above the line of unit slope, uh, whereas they should be clustered around the line of unit slope if the edge hypothesis is correct. Um, and um, however, if we repeat the experiment with a smaller one degree stimulus, we do see the same thing. Most of the data points still lie above the line of unit slope, although there are uh, one or two that lie below. So what do I think is going on? I think what's going on is an effect of um, uncontrolled um, eye movements. You try to focus on a, a spot, perhaps as a, a dot at the center of the stimulus, or the instrument I use as crosshairs. You try to keep your gaze fixed, but of course involuntary eye movements mean that the stimulus is dancing around on the retina. Um, typically, the size of these eye mov movements is about a one third of a degree. So that's quite a large fraction of a one degree stimulus size. And so what it means is that you're sampling an area of the retina which is larger than the actual stimulus size. And if that's the case, then the macular pigment density that you measure would be less than would be obtained if you could get really good stabilization of the stimulus image on the retina. If you use a larger stimulus, like I use in the MapCat, for example, then the same effect, same size eye movements, um, would be represent um, a, a stimulated area, which is still larger than the stimulus size, but percentage-wise, uh, it's not such a big effect. Of course, we also have to consider in the experiment comparing these results with those obtained with an annulus. What happens here? Well, certainly again, the annulus is moving, moving around and therefore sampling uh, different values, if you like, of macular pigment. But you can do the calculations and the variation over the stimulated area here is much less. So I think in conclusion that when we use a small, particularly when we use a small stimulus, we will get um, a value for the macular pigment which is perhaps less than some average within the central one degree, but the reasons for that being less I think are not due to an edge effect. I'm sure there are going to be people in the audience who are going to argue with that. The third question was uh, still continuing with uh, heterochromatic flicker photometry. I think it's the best method available. Um, however, um, it does rest upon the assumption that at the level of the photoreceptors, the uh, spectral sensitivity is going to be the same in the fovea and the parafovea, so that any differences in apparent retinal sensitivity that we measure are due to the macular pigment. And this is backed up by the fact that if we use flicker photometry to measure the complete spectrum of optical density of the macular pigment, uh, we get a very close relationship with what we measure if we take the macular carotenoids and measure their absorbent spectrum in uh, a chemical environment that mimics what's going on probably in the retina. So what we did here, we used a uh, 540 nanometer as the green uh, reference wavelength. And then the test wavelength was varied from 410 up through uh, 540. So you do get this very nice uh, close uh, relationship. One thing to note is that perhaps the flicker photometry spectrum is a little bit narrower than that obtained with the lutein and the zeaxanthin. And we'll, if you bear that in mind, perhaps we'll uh, come up with a reason for that. However, if you continue with the test wavelengths up into the red region of the spectrum, it should, the macular pigment spectrum should be flat at a value of zero because, you know, you measure the carotenoids in the spectrophotometer, they don't absorb 
in that region of the spectrum. And yet, um, with flick photometry, we found that there is this so-called rise in the red. And we do not believe that it's due to any pigment. Uh, that pigment would have to be in the fovea, and it would be probably a pale blue color <laughs> to give rise to uh, a pigment, if it was, that absorbed in the orange and red portion of the spectrum. And um, so at around uh, 620 nanometers, we've got uh, a value of about uh, perhaps 0.2. We measured uh, the left and right eyes of uh, six people. And at 620 nanometers, uh, these were, were the apparent macular pigment optical densities arranged in order of increasing values, more or less. And so I'm not calling this anymore macular pigment optical density, but, uh, whoops, sorry, but rather just the log ratio of the retinal sensitivity, usually symbolized with V uh, in the uh, peripheral reference location, eight degrees to that uh, in the fovea. So this sort of suggests that maybe that difference is, is related to the, to the photoreceptors themselves. And so one possibility is that the, uh, well, the cones which are responsible for um, detecting luminance are the long and the medium wavelength sensitive cones. Possibly the ratio changes from the fovea out to the peripheral location. And that would uh, mimic an effect of an absorbing uh, pigment. So um, I went to the data of uh, Stockman and Sharp. They uh, came up with a template which is al allows you to construct a photopic luminosity function, uh, in other words, the retinal response function, for different L to M cone <laughs> ratios. So I said, OK, let's suppose we have somebody with no macular pigment. Um, represented by the black line, um, what would be the apparent macular pigment optical density spectrum if compared with a long to medium wavelength ratio of one in the fovea, it was two, three, or four in the uh, peripheral location. And indeed, you do see two things. You see this same rise in the red and also a depression in the region of where the macular pigment normally absorbs. So then I said, OK, <clears throat> let me go back to the, that graph that I showed you before in black and do a little adjustment here. Choose an appropriate long to medium wavelength cone ratio in the uh, periphery, which will, give, which will cause, the, the, cur whoops, sorry, cause the, uh, the curve here to become more or less flat. And I think, if I remember correctly, that I would need a ratio of about 1.5 in the periphery versus 1 in the fovea. Uh, I'm not entirely happy with this because the curve over here is still continuing to rise. I couldn't go any further into that region of the spectrum. It would be interesting uh, to see what happens as you, as you go even further. Um, the other thing is that the curve over in this region is slightly broadened. And if you recall, that will make the curve even closer to the spectrum of lutein and zeaxanthin that we measure with a spectrophotometer. The last question um, was related to something that uh, my graduate student very briefly talked about last uh, two years ago, <clears throat> he presented a poster and was therefore given a few minutes to try to get through everything on the podium. So let me go a little bit more slowly here. I see I've still got the green light. Where uh, many of us are now using flicker photometers which use broad-based LED light sources. And that's great. Um, they're easy to control, but they do have uh, the problem of having a pretty broad uh, bandwidth. Therefore, when you make the measurements with a lead-based photometer, you have to certainly correct for the finite bandwidths 
of the LEDs, otherwise the macular pigment optical density will be lower than it really is. And the other thing which, um, as far as I know, only the MapCat does is to make uh, a correction for the increasing lens optical density with age, the, the yellowing lens. The equation is rather complicated. On the left, we've got the two uh, things that we actually measure. The, they represent the intensity of the blue light needed to uh, form a luminance match with the green light in the flicker photometer, first in the fovea and then in the para or peri fovea. Those are, so that's what we measure. The thing that we want is the macular pigment optical density, here represented by the symbol P, and D there is a normalized optical density spectrum. The equation also contains the uh, energy spectra of the sources, and here the luminosity function, which has to be taken as a function not only of wavelength but also of age. If you solve the equation, you get the relationship between the uh, log ratio of those two intensity measurements and the peak optical density for different ages. So, um, and by the way, if you use monochromatic sources, this log ratio is the macular pigment optical density. However, with broad, these broadband sources, you could have a person, say, giving you a log ratio of 0.5, that would translate to, say, 0.8 optical density for a 20-year-old, but the same 0.5 would translate to maybe 1.1 for an 80-year-old. So you have to take the age or the effective age of the lens into account. So what we did was uh, a simulation study. We used uh, a random number generator to simulate uh, 200 hypothetical subjects whose macular pigment optical densities ranged from 0 to 1 and whose ages ranged from uh, 20 to 90 years. And we said, OK, if we put them on a typical LED-based flicker photometer, what log ratio of intensities would those subjects give us? And that's what we get. And those now show an age-related decline. Right? So really, their macular pigments, as we saw from the previous slide, were chosen not to have any age-related effect. But the log ratio does, in fact, show a decline with age. Now, what we, what we do in the MapCat is take those log ratios and use the correct equation to give us the correct macular pigment optical densities represented by the green uh, circles here, which are the same as uh, what I showed you two slides ago. However, if you only do a partial correction, that is, if you correct for the finite bandwidth of the LEDs, but you use a standard luminosity function, that is, you assume that everybody has the same retinal sensitivity, why 32 years? Because uh, the standard uh, curve that you come across is uh, based on data for a group of subjects of average age 32. So when you do that, um, you get the red circles. And once again, it seems to show an age-related decline. So we have to be very careful. There have been some studies which looked at um, the question, does macular pigment, uh, on average, change with age? Some studies say it goes down. Some have shown it goes up. Uh, some have shown it stays steady. And I think, again, two conferences ago, Tos Berenschat gave us a very good review of all the results of these studies. But uh, this uh, apparent decline is actually comparable to some real studies using uh, LED-based flicker so we just need to be a little bit careful in interpreting these results. I'm still on orange, so 
Um, so my conclusions are, first of all, that uh, at least based on their distributions of the retina, we should not be singling out any one particular retinal uh, carotenoid and, and describing it as the central carotenoid. Secondly, my, certainly my data uh, invalidate the edge effect hypothesis, and I think uh, <coughs> the, what we're seeing is perhaps an effect of imprecise fixation. Many subjects really do find it difficult to keep their gaze steady on a fixation mark. Uh, but macular pigment measured by flicker photometry, we may be slightly underestimating it if the L long to medium wavelength cone ratio is not in fact constant across the retina. And uh, finally, be, be careful about interpreting apparent age-related changes in macular pigment. Uh, thanks to Guardian Health Sciences and to Benaseed, who provided support for this, and to Hanaban, who many of you met at the last conference, and I can report that uh, last week he defended successfully his dissertation. He's now looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions, I think. Yes, Toss. I'm, I'm scared of your questions, Toss. Just from my understanding about the edge hypothesis, it's uh, although your explanation is different, the, 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 the results will be the same. That indeed you measure a value which relates to the edge. Well, I don't know if I'd say it <coughs> relates to the edge. I would say that it's probably less than would be obtained with a, <coughs> a truly well-stabilized image on the retina. In other words, it, it represents something which is less than the average value within the central one degree, for example. So, so, so if you measure one degree, at, at what eccentricity, what would it relate to? Well, um, from the studies we did, um, the value seems to, when we, when we looked at uh, distributions, say within the central one and a half degrees, um, the value that we obtained with the solid stimulus seemed to match um, that obtained with an annular stimulus of about three quarters the size of the stimulus itself. And <clears throat> that agreed actually with some results from Jack Morland, who did the same thing with his motion, minimum motion photometry. We, we tried to relate our reflectance technique and we came up with similar results. So, yeah, yeah. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Randy. So, so, so yeah, so I, I mean, I guess Jack Werner was the first who came up with the idea of the edge effect, and his data showed a pretty close edge effect. And our data is also different than yours in the sense that it shows a very strong edge effect. So I've, I've been trying to uh, figure out what might be different between the two. And, and uh, one idea I had was the luminance of the, of the test versus the luminance of the background. And what, what was the luminance of your test and background? <clears throat> About 20 candelas per square. So I, I guess, uh, was it the same for the test and for the background? Yes. So, so, yes, so because... if there's not a lot of contrast between the, the test and the background, then it is, that would reduce your ability to even see the edge. So that might be one reason why you get less of an edge effect. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Okay. Another? I'll pro probably argue about this for years to come. Okay. <laughs> okay. In the back, Jim. Hi, Professor Bohn. Great oh, talk. I'm uh, particularly intrigued by this red boost uh, yes. in the spectral data. And, and I've seen that, too, and i just thinking about it during your, your talk. Um, you know, it's a dramatic rise, you know, yes. apparently showing this 0.3, you know, three-tenths of an optical, you know, density unit. Um, and I, I get to thinking about it, maybe, I mean, the primary difference you're looking at here is spatially is uh, central fovea versus eight degrees eccentricity. And so then you think, well, what's the most parsimonious explanation there in terms of retinal, you know, topography, uh, pigments? And it's really, if you want to get down to it, it's 
could be the rods, right? Now, granted, you're probably at photopic conditions and assuming that you're using cones for these, you know, judgments. But what if, I mean, you're, you're comparing a 540 with the variable wavelength across the, across the spectrum. Is, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Rods don't absorb out in the red, uh, but they do appreciably absorb, you know, 540 nanometers. Not strongly, but enough to maybe show that effect. So, you know, just suspend disbelief here for a second. Uh, it's possible that, you know, you may show that apparent boost in a macular pigment absorption out there at 600 nanometers because rods may be actually absorbing not the long wavelength, but the 540. And so you need more energy or less, or however it would work out, you take the ratio and it would show as a, as a boost. It Does would. that make sense? It would, wouldn't yeah. it? So yes. I don't know, that's a kind of a backwards way of thinking about it. Not normally how we think about the measurement of these but, things. But, but, but it would, under photopic conditions, I think it would, it would be an extremely large effect, and it would <clears throat> it would tend to indicate a a, a lot of involvement yeah. of of rod vision. But it could explain that dramatic boost. I mean, it's rod. I suppose go one, up one I suppose one could test for that by yeah. uh, running the experiment at ever increasing levels of luminance. Exactly. And thereby uh, decreasing contributions from rods. Yeah, you might see That'd that come up or down. Yeah. 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 So. One more question. If, if I may, uh, you brought a question, uh, is it correct that HFP is a golden standard or not? I think you have not given the answer to this question completely. <laughs> is it I true? would reverse the question. From my perspective, uh, the customized HFP, those where you really identify per individual the CFF, which we discussed before, then you have really the golden standard for this technology, also people like uh, like John Nolan have proven that before and after cataract operation, the change in the optical system is not changing the value of the macular pigment. And I always believe that that is the reason why this technique is considered to be the golden standard. With all the weaknesses, and you listed here a few weaknesses, it's still considered to be the golden standard, or is there a disagreement? Mm -hmm. I don't want to start it, I just want to. Yeah. No, I, I agree with He's you. trying to pick a fight. <laughs> Anything more? No? Okay. All right, next, our next. Thank you very much.